Um, can you hear me all right? Yep. All right, this is Transportation Committee Chair Deb Barber. It is Monday, July 12th, 2021. Before I call the meeting to order, I'd like to say a few things about how we will conduct this meeting. Um, currently, we are, um, I want to acknowledge that COVID-19 is causing us to alter our usual procedures. As a result, we're conducting this meeting electronically. All votes will be taken by roll call. Um, before we start the meeting, we need to establish whether or not there's a quorum. With that, Becky, can you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Here. Cummings. Here. Ferguson. Fredson. Here. Gonzalez. Sterner. Zirin. Barber. Here. Having a quorum present, I call to order the meeting of the July 12, 2021 Transportation Committee. Uh, our first order of business is approval of the agenda. Um, did anyone have any changes to the agenda? I would like to propose one change where we take the um, I, number four information item and move it to number two on our list of information items, if that's every, okay with everyone. All right, because we did um, change the agenda, I don't know that we have to have a motion or not. Um, Becky, do you know? Yeah, we should do a motion in a second. Okay, and we'll call. then perfect. Yeah, um, if I could interrupt, Madam yep. Chair, I think we also wanted to switch the order of Cole and Dave Burns' presentations following the Metro Transit one. Okay, so it'll go one, four, three, two? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, uh, if there isn't any other questions about that, I'd entertain a, a motion to approve the agenda as amended. It's Fredson, so moved. Moved by Fredson, is there a second? Chambliss. Seconded by Chambliss, is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, uh, Becky, could you call the roll please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez, Sterner, Zirin, Barber. Aye. With that, the agenda is approved. Next thing we are on to approval of the minutes from the June 28th, 2021 meeting. Did anyone have changes or additions to the minutes? All right, seeing none, uh, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Fredson move approval. It's moved by Fredson, is there a second? I mean, seconds. Seconded by Cummings. Is there any other discussion? Seeing, seeing and hearing none, um, Becky, would you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Sterner. Zirin. Barber. Aye. With that, the minutes are approved. Next, we're on to reports. And the first is we have MTS and we have Acting Director Amy Benowitz here to, to present. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I just have a couple items today related to some recent press that we have been getting on some of our planning work, positive press. Um, first, uh, we had an article in the Star Tribune this past weekend and an interview both with Steve Peterson, who leads our highway planning group, uh, the interview will air on WCCO tonight at 6 and again tomorrow morning. Both of them are regarding the $60 million federal infra grant the region received for the I-494 MinPass corridor project. We were a co-applicant with MnDOT on this $300 plus million project, um, which will build a MinPass lane from Trunk Highway 169 to 35W in the cities of Edina and Bloomington, um, touching Richfield too. The 494 project will be built in three phases over several years and eventually will extend the MinPass lane all the way to the airport. This is one of the priorities for MinPass that was identified in our transportation policy plan a number of years ago. And so it's really starting to work us towards building out our MinPass system for the region. Secondly, we also continue to get attention on our work related to tracking travel trends. 
Ashley Asmus, our lead data scientist, participated in an interview with Fox 9 News that aired last week, I believe on Friday. Ashley provided them with a graphic that is on the council's website, which tracks the regional travel trends and currently shows that regional travel is getting close to being back to pre-pandemic levels overall. Uh, we're still down about five to 8%, depending on the location. But the data also shows that traffic is much more distributed throughout the afternoon peak. We don't have as strong of an afternoon peak, but it is starting earlier and extending longer into the evening. In addition, the morning peak continues uh, to be significantly down uh, below pre-pandemic levels. So we will continue to monitor these trends and update the graphic that is on our website and eventually determine what all of this means for our highway investment needs in the region. Um, but in the meantime, it's really interesting and good information and the press has really been paying attention to it over the whole COVID pandemic really. So that is all I have to report today, Madam Chair. Thank you. Amy, are there questions from council members? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to Metro Transit General Manager Koistra. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, I will keep it brief today, be recognizing the, uh, the number of items, information items we have. So my report will be short. I just want to note very quickly that we continue to work hard to recruit operators uh, to reach our ideal operator level. As part of the, of the operating hiring efforts, we're holding another one-day event uh, this week. Uh, this event will take place this Saturday, July 17th at 9 a.m. to noon at the Metro Transit Instruction Center. And I want to encourage all of you to share the information with any people, organizations you know who might be well positioned uh, to help get out, get out the word. And to help disseminate this, the word we attached a flyer for Saturday's event to today's daily report and provided a flyer to Hannah Palmeyer and Peter Grafston. So uh, we're looking for all the help we can get. We need to hire operators. Uh, we had two events, as you know, previously that attracted about um, uh, that we, for which we were able to bring 40 applicants to the next step. And so uh, we're going to continue to hold these one day events. Uh, uh, in order to try to reach the operator levels that, that we need to reach. Um, with that, uh, I'm finished with my report. Thank you, Wes. Um, are there questions from council members? All right, thank you. Uh, with that, we're on to our business for the day. So we have no items on consent. We have one item on um, um, on non-consent, it's business item 2021-172, Southwest LRT, SEH contract amendment number three. And I believe we have Jim Alexander here to present. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Jim Alexander, project director for the Southwest LRT project. Uh, so the item tonight is related to the SEH contract that's uh, short Elliot Hendrickson. They're a consultant that's uh, helping us with monitoring of uh, contaminated materials as the civil contractor does their work out in the field. And we need this firm to uh, essentially identify, correctly identify contaminated materials that need to be uh, hauled off site, uh, either to uh, direct sell or, uh, or for daily daily cover. And uh, so this is related to a business item that uh, was brought before the council back in May, May 26, uh, business item number 2021-108, related to uh, increase in contaminating soils or materials that we have on the project. And so we need to have a consultant uh, continue the work to uh, monitor this, uh, this work as a civil contractor is doing their work. Uh, we have previously uh, amended this contract uh, in the past, and you see the in the background where we originally started a little over uh, two two million dollars for the contract, and we have uh, we have uh, in uh, in a subsequent amendment we added eight hundred fifty three thousand dollars to the contract to account for uh, some delays that the uh, 
the civil construction was experiencing and uh, and just to account for the means and methods that were uh, used by the civil contractor that were different from the assumptions made in the original contract. And so, Madam Chair, I have a proposed action that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute amendment number three to contract 16P298 with short Elliott Hendrickson for construction monitoring of contaminated materials to add $3,116,522 for a total contract amount of $6,115,508. And I would also like to mention that uh, we do track the DBE uh, goal pretty closely here. The original contract was uh, slated at 15% and SEH is currently uh, achieving just over 18% DBE. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Jim. Are there questions from council members? All right, um, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-172. Cummings moves approval. It's moved by Cummings. Is there a second? Fredson will second. Seconded by Fredson. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Becky, could you come to the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Sterner. Zirin. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. And that completes our actual business for the evening. I would um, recommend that that um, item move um, on consent to the full council, unless there's objections. All right. Then we're on to our information items. The first one is trans transportation equity working definition. Um, we have Heidi Schalberg here, and she's going to introduce a couple of people from MnDOT who are joining us this evening. Uh, Chair, I saw a hand up. Oh, I apologize. Uh, Madam Chair, that this is Amy Gunwitz again. I'm sorry, I goofed up when I changed that agenda order, and it's for the third and fourth ones that they should have stayed with Cole Hineker first and then Dave Burns with the before and after study last. So okay, my apologies for that. That's all right. That should be fine, I think. Okay. All right, so um, Heidi, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, I will keep this really short. So I'm Heidi Schalberg, Transportation Planner in MTS, and I'm pleased to have two of our colleagues here today from MnDOT, who we regularly work closely with um, on transportation planning issues in general. And so they're here today to talk about their work on statewide multimodal transportation planning and specifically transportation equity. Um, they presented to our equity advisory committee at their meeting last month. And so we wanted to ensure that um, they had a chance to come and connect with this committee on the same topic tonight. Um, so we have Abdullahi Abdullah, who is MnDOT's transportation equity planning coordinator. And we also have Hallie Turner, who is their policy planning director. And so with that, I will just go ahead and turn it over to Abdullahi for the presentation. Thanks, Heidi. Do you want us to share the presentation itself or do you have it up? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. As Heidi said, my name is Abdullahi Abdullah. I am... First of all, I would like to start by thanking you, your time, Madam Chair, and members of the committee for having us tonight to talk to you about uh, MnDOT's transportation uh, equity and specifically the transportation equity definition. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Hallie Turner, uh, who will be in the background and, and have some extensive uh, understanding and, and knowledge about transportation equity initiatives at MnDOT and can answer some additional questions if they come up. A um, little bit about me. I started this role about three months ago. Uh, I'm, let me actually start with my pronouns, which are he and him. Uh, and I started the role three months ago to lead our uh, transportation equity planning uh, work uh, here in our central office in that. Uh, what I will talk, next slide, please. What I will talk to you tonight uh, is specifically the definition, but I wanted to start with some, some little bit of context. So the Minnesota goal is where uh, the work that we are trying to do to the, the transportation equity definition is housed in. The Minnesota Go vision again is the vision for transportation for the entire state. 
Uh, in this vision, we aim to deliver a multimodal transportation system that maximizes the health of people uh, for the environment and our economy. Again, in other words, the vision answers some questions like, what are we trying to achieve? Uh, another next slide, please. So under the Minnesota Go vision is what we are actively working on right now. The Minnesota vision is five year, 50 year vision. Uh, there's another plan which is directly underneath that, which is our own statewide multimodal transportation plan, or what we call SMTP for short. SMTP includes what we refer to as family of plans. That includes the Greater Minnesota Transit Investment Plan. It includes uh, things like pedestrian and bicycle plans, and a highway investment plan, and also freight, aviation, and rail plans, as well as ports and waterway plans. The statewide multimodal transportation plan or SMTP answers the question of how we are trying to achieve or how are we trying to achieve the Minnesota Go vision, that 50 year vision for the state. Uh, this is for people that are walking on biking or rolling or taking to transit or people that are uh, using our airport systems or our waterways. Next slide, please. Now, the this SMTB or statewide multimodal transportation plan translates the that go vision, the Minnesota go vision into general policy direction for MINDAT and also other transportation partners. The plan is for all users and all modes of transportation, and it's also applicable to anyone or any agency that has a role in our transportation systems. This plan that is SMTB is updated every five years. The last update was rolled out in 2017, and now we're actively working on the next update, which will be up uh, or out early next year or 2022. Next slide, please. Now, through our conversations with community members throughout the state uh, in 2017, so the last iteration of this update, we have heard a lot about community members for us to focus on these six areas that you see here. Those are aging infrastructure, climate change, economy and employment, transportation options, safety, and more appropriately for our conversation today, transportation equity. Uh, people wanted us to have more uh, nuanced conversations and engagement and understanding about, about these topic areas. And each one of these topic areas or focus areas have a focus that are uh, comprised of internal transportation uh, experts as well as community members to advise on how to take some steps towards uh, uh, next in these in these focus areas. Next slide, please. But as we were having these conversations in the last couple of years, there were there was no consensus on how to define equity and what that means, whether that is and how, how does show up for showing up for everyone? Is it geographic equity? Is it something different? Is it modal equity or is it about ability? So there was it wasn't defined. Uh, a little bit more about uh, the work that we have done. Next slide, please. So the work of that is where we started our advancing transportation equity initiative. This is a host of initiatives that Minla, MINDAT uh, has been leading, and, and some of them are still going actively going on uh, since 2017 or 2018 timeframe. We started these initiatives, including multiple research projects. Some of those have been completed, others are still underway. We had uh, completed a research project, for example, which we were calling Research Roadmap, which we, under which we were working with the University of Minnesota. And this was specifically geared towards the state trans uh, departments of transportation, where we could uh, think about how to guide equity and incorporate equity into our transportation systems. Uh, we also looked into developing a set of performance measures uh, as a research project to work by working with Texas, Texas Transportation Institute uh, to review our existing performance measures and, and see their, how, how they um, can answer and, and hold us accountable when it comes to like uh, transportation equity. We are also in the process of kicking off another research project around gender equity, in which we are partnering with uh, Metropolitan Council on travel behavior infantry as one of the data sources that we use for that project. We have also started a series of community conversations 
to directly engage with community-based groups and organizations in rural and, and urban as well throughout the state, uh, really, to have better understanding of some of the challenges that are coming up coming out for people and, and how to, to uh, come up with solutions to address those challenges. Um, we have been taking some steps towards our own like internal programs and policies and process improvements to ask ourselves a series of questions about who our different systems and processes and policies are really helping or who, uh, what groups are they, are they specifically uh, harming. And we are also thinking about equity when it comes to uh, updating our own plans. So right now we're doing our statewide multimodal transportation plan and equity is at the center of our conversations. Uh, performance measures is called out here, It's uh, but I talked about it on the research project. So next slide, please. Now, these are some of the lessons that uh, were learned or some of the things that stood out or initially came up from our conversations. One of the biggest challenges was what we are here to talk about today, which is the definition of transportation equity, because we didn't have a, a level understanding of or a definition of transportation equity. It was very challenging for people to have a unified discussion about, about transportation equity and what that means. What is it? So people had uh, no uh, level, uh, base level understanding or to start those, that conversation. Uh, so the work to define transportation equity is really grounded in the community engagement efforts and, and, and interests that, that have been started in the last couple of years. Uh, another thing that came out uh, from our conversations with community members was the importance of acknowledging uh, historic inequities because more often when we are talking, when we are putting together our plans and, and programs, we are more future, like uh, forward looking and thinking about the future of transportation, not necessarily pausing and thinking about the past and the historic harms that transportation caused to some specific communities or, or some communities. Uh, another thing that came out, or some of the one of the lessons learned, is that uh, sometimes we might focus on specific areas or neighborhoods when we're thinking about transportation solutions. But it's also important to address some of the broader transportation challenges that are coming out uh, and have applicability throughout the state. Uh, another thing that came out from uh, one of the things that we learned from these conversations is that yes, even though uh, it's important to do research and have level setting, uh, setting, understand where we are on transportation equity. It's not enough, and that we need to do more than that and come up with solutions. Next slide, please. So now, a little bit more context to our transportation equity before I reveal our definition in the next slide is that I I would like to use I'm using this graphic which is a bit simplistic and sometimes can confuse people as it there's one model of one mode of transportation that is used here which is a bicycle and the idea here is not to show preference for bicycles nothing against bicycles i like biking but this is to indicate that transportation equity is not really the same as equal distribution of resources in this example you see uh three people that you visibly need have different uh, needs but at the same time they were given the same bicycle which is equal distribution of resources so this is equality it's not equity transportation equity is rather trying to understand people's needs by letting them uh, their own stories so that you understand what type of bicycle this person needs, what type of bicycle or vehicle or other transportation mode that will need their needs. It's about understanding specific uh, transportation issues that people are, are facing by hearing from them. It's also about being specific about what problems we are trying to address. So it's a little bit getting to the, to the, into the, more understand contextual understanding of people's unique circumstances and needs. Transportation equity is also about humanizing the transportation industry and, and thinking about people and centering people in our discussions and conversations, uh, which is very difficult. In transportation talk, we often 
get into the weeds about data and vehicle level of services and asset conditions. Yes, those are very important uh, metrics and elements that we have to consider, but people are really uh, what transportation equity is about. Uh, transportation equity is also about uh, naming, naming trans various transportation harms and, and inequities uh, that have happened in the past, as, as we talked about in, it was one of the lessons learned that the importance of uh, naming and acknowledging harm. Uh, and that is still essential because we cannot just look forward and think about future solutions if we don't pause and look up, uh, think about the, the past and, and reassess uh, and think about how we came to where we are today. And most importantly, though, to just reemphasize this transportation equity is about centering people in our transportation conversation, especially people that have endured so much harm. I'm saying this because in the definition that we will share, uh, it will be apparent there are some specific historically excluded groups that would be called out. Uh, and that is by, it was the, the intention was just to make sure that we, this is reflective of, of uh, past harms, but also uh, looking forward at the same time. So now the next slide, we will reveal uh, what our current draft transportation equity definition looks like. This is still in draft format. Any and uh, any feedback is very helpful and necessary, and and we really appreciate that. And Halley put that also in the chat. So thank you, Halley. I will be quiet for a second here and let you uh, read that, and then I will talk about how this came about and what my ask is today of you all. So hopefully people read through this. Uh, this is how we're defining transportation equity. It's not final, as I said. I will just repeat this multiple times. This is still draft. So anything that you pick out, anything that you think should not be here is very helpful and necessary. And we'll take that uh, uh, back to a group that uh, helped us draft this. So this is how this came about, is that we worked with one of the six focus areas that uh, focus uh, area work groups that I talked about, the equity work group, and a small team of, of uh, volunteers that helped us craft this definition, and they, put, they proposed this definition for us. What we're doing right now is fitting this uh, through the process, connecting with people uh, from MINDAD and, and MBOs like Net Council, as well as uh, other transportation um, uh, insiders, as well as community-based organizations and individual community members to make sure this transportation resonates with people, this, uh, to make sure this transportation is reflective of how they experience transportation. Uh, and in the next month, uh, the next couple of months after starting August up until end of the year, we will be fitting this through the, through the process. It's starting with the equity work group, who will take everything that we have heard so far and then refine this transportation equity definition so it looks a little bit different and reflective of everything that we have heard so far. Um, so my ask of you today is to share your perspectives, uh, your thoughts, uh, things that stood out to you as you saw this definition. Um, and then if you have any recommendations of people, uh, either organizations or individuals that you would like us to connect with, we will we'll do so. So those are my asks. Um, I have some additional slides, but they are all about uh, those next steps and also some process uh, uh, next steps. I will just pause here and, and hear any initial questions or, or comments. Thank you, Abdullahi. Um, any questions from council members or comments? I'm not seeing any hands up yet, but I would love to hear what our EAC, what their feedback was to you. I think I have to take that one, Abdullahi, because I was there. And well, I, yes. was, I was in deep listening mode. So I'm going to pull up my notes so that I make sure that I don't mischaracterize anything that people said. And I will invite Heidi to step in and clarify if I missed or have misspoken at all. I, a lot of notes, Abdullahi even this week was like, how did you type so much when you were presenting the information? And I wanted to hear it all. So pretty consistently uh, across the board, but also definitely at the equity uh, the EAC, we were hearing that things like fair, 
feels like it's out of place because when people hear fair, they hear equal. Um, and whether or not that's actually the case, that's how people interpret it. So when we're putting out a definition about equity, that, that should cause us some pause to see if we're using the right word. We also had people say that they were getting stuck on kind of the acknowledgement of burdens. Um, like, how do we conceive, obviously in this definition, it does I say BIPOC, but what does like a burden actually mean? And we don't always do a great job in transportation describing that. There was a conversation about how services stand out. We talk a lot about things like the transportation system as a whole or if we're doing projects we do environmental justice analysis but we don't always talk about like how we actually serve our communities once our transportation system is built so services was an important acknowledgement that people don't always see in conversations around transportation equity there was support for acknowledging the historic harms which Abdullahi had shared as a lesson that Mandat has been taking in as well there were there were conversations on how can we make sure that we can continue to acknowledge these injustices but also acknowledge that we are kind of on notice to proceed differently in the future in order to mitigate them and while this definition highlights decision making for example that's not the only means by which we have to mitigate there, there was a lot to unpack in the eac heidi is there anything that you would add that i missed that's coming to mind for you no, I think that was a great summary, Hallie. Great, and thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, anything else from other council members? I will just, just council, a quick. This is council member oh, Chambliss. Council member Chambliss. Oh, that's okay. So um, I agree with the feedback regarding the transportation equity working definition. Um, Transportation equity ensures the benefits and burdens. Um, I might replace the word burden with ensure the benefits and investments of transportation, spending services and systems. And then the um, the word fair, um, I would maybe make that um, more specific to the goal um, that you're trying to achieve. So maybe think about that when you talk about rewording it. Um, fair is often um, uh, subjective uh, and difficult to measure. So if you could think about um, a word that equates to the outcome in getting to equity, that might be more helpful. Or just take that our fair part out completely because equity is what the focus is. That's just my two cents. <laughs> I think those are good comments because fair can be very subjective to whoever's interpreting fair. Um, at least, yeah, that's the way I see it, I think. So, um, all right, any other questions or comments from council members? Um, so, uh, um, if I run through um, one of your further slides, just a little bit of uh, information for the committee members. The uh, engagement will go throughout the summer, and the equity regroup will um, refine the definition based off of all of this input. So, please, if you have additional input as you reflect this, um, get it to Abdullahi and, and Heli. Um, they would appreciate it. Um, it'll go to the Policy Advisory Committee in October and then um, uh, through final review in October and November and will be included in the draft SMTP in early 2022. So there is some time, but definitely please reflect on this and send any comments along to our partners at MnDOT. Um, all right, anything else from anyone? Uh, Abdullahi or Hallie, do you need anything from us beyond that? No, that's great. Thanks, Madam Chair, for summarizing the, some of the next step, steps on how to get connected with us and uh, get feedback to us. That That is all we're asking for. Please, uh, if you, as you reflect on this, especially if this is the first time that you have seen this, we do understand this. It will take a minute until you can think about, like, to think about the whole thing and what you would like to change or what you like, to, what suggestions you have. So please um, connect with us. Our emails are, I think, one of the last slide. Uh, so uh, reach out to us and, and let us know if you have any additional uh, thoughts. This is the last couple of slides just have some some additional engagement efforts that are going undergoing that I mean that's doing to just connect with the with the public uh, 
throughout about the state one open road transportation plan uh, but these are our emails so please uh, feel free to reach out or suggest some other community members that you would like us to come and talk to and have either one-on-one -on -one conversations or group conversations with people so again thank you so much for having us tonight man absolutely sure um, go ahead amy oh, thanks i'm sorry to interrupt but I did want to interject and say if council members are, have comments or are sending comments, if they could copy me on those. And what Heidi and I will do is compile the comments in total and, um, if, and then come back to either you or the committee and see if we should send a council letter if we have widespread agreement among council members we can have that conversation whether the council as a whole wants to send a comment letter on to MnDOT. Thank you, Amy. That's a good point. And I think um, Heidi serves on the equity work group, so she's well connected with all of this, this work. And so it's a good opportunity to um, um, uh, kind of uh, centralize things through her and Amy. OK, right. thank you. Yep, absolutely. All right, well, um, if there's no other questions or comments from council members, um, thank you, Abdullah and Hallie, appreciate you coming today. So we'll try and get you some feedback. Thanks, have a great night. You too, bye now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next, we're on to what uh, our next information item is the emerging from the pandemic, a stronger and better transit system, part one. And we have Wes Koistra, Eric Lynn, Adam Harrington, and Brian Funk. I'm not sure which one of you is kicking off. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna Madam Chair, I'll, uh, this is Wes, and I'll start the. I'll start us off. I'll just say, as a matter of introduction, that today is the first part of a two-part information item series, outlining how Metro Transit is working to emerge from a, the pandemic, a stronger and better transit system. For the last year, uh, we've we've been engaging in future planning at Metro Transit among its leadership and staff, and our goals is to not simply return the pre-pandemic as usual, but rather to use this as an opportunity to seek ways to improve the way that we serve customers and the region. This includes being deliberate and intentional and embedding equity and sustainability into our decision making. And today, part one, the part one presentation will focus on the data. Uh, we are watching our August quarterly service changes and the operating hiring update. At the July 26th meeting, we'll talk more about how we are using this data and other information and taking advantage of new opportunities to develop a broad-based approach to emerging from the pandemic, to rebuilding ridership, and to strengthening our transit system. So this is coming to you in two parts. This is the introduction. And I will, with that, I'm gonna turn it over, I believe, to Eric Lynn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Wes. Um, Thanks for having me here. So you can move on to the next one, please. Uh, tonight, as Wes mentioned, we're sort of laying the groundwork for our stronger and better plans, which we'll be presenting over the next two sessions. So there's three pieces to the presentation tonight. The first one is talking a little bit about transit fundamentals and things that we think we know that are still true, even during COVID and, uh, and as the period after COVID, whatever that becomes known as. The second bit is gonna be the bulk of the presentation, which is what are the data that we've been watching during the pandemic? What are the things we're watching for changes going forward? And then of course, what are the implications of those? And as we move into the third part, we'll talk about near term uh, service changes that are happening and how this data is informing our medium term planning as well with the whole stronger and better effort. Next. Okay, so starting with what we know, and really this is a, a, just a two slide crash course in uh, transit planning. Next slide, please. And the reason that we wanted to start with this is just to remind everyone that there are certain things that are true structurally about how transit works and where it works and when it works that are still true during COVID. They're still true after COVID. They're true because it has to do with the layout of um, you know, communities and how efficient it is to bring people to and from in those corridors using shared vehicles like transit vehicles. So um, there's always a dance in transit between supply and demand. Uh, we know that the uh, transit supply that we put out there 
is most effective and most efficient when it is direct, when it is frequent, when the, when the time of day that the service is running matches the time of day that uh, someone or people want to travel, and when the travel time is competitive. And so all of these, of course, feed back on each other. You know, if you have a direct line between two places on a corridor, that's certainly going to be a, a competitive travel time versus kind of a wandering, meandering route. Uh, you know, if you have a frequent service, you're going to be more likely to match um, when someone is ready to depart on their particular trip. And so all these things are kind of positive feedbacks on each other. Uh, so we know how to provide this service, which will which will uh, meet the demands of people that travel. The trick with transit is that we cannot do this everywhere for every trip. Okay, so um, the resources at some level, which we'll get to at the end of this presentation, constrain our ability to provide direct, frequent, all day competitive travel time service. And so in looking at where and when we can provide service, we have to try to match that service to the demand that we think will be there. And as we provide the service and see the demand, we have to adjust based on that. So next slide, please. There's a lot of guidance that we have from regional policy. So the transportation policy plan, Appendix G, uh, the document goes into great detail about where, when, how much, what type, uh, spacing between routes, spacing between stops, lots of details that guide this investment uh, based on the demand profile that is uh, likely present in different communities. Um, and the map on the right is a refresher of the transit market areas, which uh, are defined based on population and job concentrations, walkability and car ownership, the sorts of things that you would think predict transit being very successful. Uh, and just as a reminder, as you go from the dark uh, blue urban centers out to the lighter blue to the green, you're kind of stepping down in order of magnitude of um, transit supply and demand. Okay, so next slide, please. So with those uh, fundamentals in mind, um, lots has changed, obviously. Uh, and, and we've been before this committee talking about ridership changes before. And so some of this might be uh, repetitive, but it's still good to look at it with a, maybe a fresh lens. So I'm gonna go through a few of the things we're watching during COVID and then also what we're watching to indicate how things are changing um, now that we might be coming out of a full COVID uh, environment. So next slide, please. So the first slide is one I know you've seen before, but to, um, to refresh your memory, this is a, a time series really telling the story of what's happened to ridership on Metro Transit since March, 2020, which is the zero line, if you will, kind of at the top left there. And of course there have been big changes, big losses in ridership, but for, the, for today's uh, conversation, what I wanna focus on uh, are two things. One is the difference between um, types of transit here. And so if you look at the blue colored dots, the green colored dots, the red colored dots, uh, moving from top to bottom. So that's the local bus network, the light rail system, and then the commuter, uh, commuter express bus and commuter rail in North Star. And you see that they all have sort of different levels that they settled out at during COVID. And the local bus, uh, including the arterial BRT network, was much more robust to COVID in terms of ridership loss than was the light rail. And both of those were much more robust than the uh, commuter express patterns. Now, of course, this, this to me simply reflects the proportion of the trip making happening on these modes that is connected to uh, one particular trip that isn't happening much anymore. And of course, that's the work to office commute. Okay, so the office nine to five commute is a trip that uh, essentially disappeared from the landscape and, and is barely recovering as we move forward. Um, and so to the extent that each of these types of service served that trip purpose, they've been impacted uh, sort of different relative scales. So the first thing is the difference in levels. The second thing is, is um, even though there are some kind of um, uh, ups and downs, some little wiggles, if you will, as you go across through time, uh, the remarkable thing about these levels is that they've been really stable. Uh, there haven't been big jumps and dips as things have changed over the last 15 months. Uh, there's kind of been a consistency to the ridership on these different modes 
uh, that I think reflects um, the fact that the travel behavior underlying this hasn't changed very much either. So we've had a lot of stability in terms of who is using transit and for what purposes. We don't have a lot of great detail on those individual uh, purposes, but we can infer some things, especially from what we'll talk about next. But uh, the thing about um, travel behavior, you often hear, heard it, hear it described as being sticky. This is especially true for things like work commutes where you get into patterns based on a weekday or a, whatever your nine to five schedule might be. And that repetition kind of reinforces itself over time. It can become difficult to change. And what we saw with COVID was there was a massive forced change in people's travel behavior to say the least. Uh, and the question that we have before us in trying to figure out transit demand and supply is how sticky were those changes? And as the constraints that COVID put on us are released, how much is that gonna change back? So next, please. So one of the biggest changes that, uh, and, and thank you, Amy, for bringing up the um, news report that, that featured this data from our colleagues at MTS, uh, because it, it drives exactly with this, which is, um, whereas we had these very sharp peaks prior to COVID, which is a, represented in the dash line here, sort of the uh, boardings that are happening by hour of day, there was a very symmetrical AM and PM peak. This is the same thing on the transit system and the roadway, and of course they're related. Uh, but we used to have uh, this very distinct two hump shape. And in fact, um, during COVID and since, what we've had instead is a single peak. We've had a building of trips throughout the day towards a late afternoon peak, and then somewhat of a, a normal decline into the evening hours. Um, and what this reflects is rather than having a dominance of, again, that single trip purpose of nine to five office commuting, you have an accumulation of lots of different trip purposes throughout the day. So uh, if you're going out to run errands at 11 o'clock, there might be two of your neighbors doing the same thing. If you do an errand at three, there might be eight of your neighbors doing the same thing. That's the general idea is that there's this kind of accumulation of lots of different, not coordinated trip making. And it's what you see if you if you are out on a Saturday and, and you run an errand that at eight in the morning, there's no traffic, but at four, you might run into um, a slowdown. That's just simply lots of people traveling for different purposes. Um, so this is an important dynamic because it changes the shape of our service, which of course has been oriented towards these peaks as well. Next slide. So in addition to sort of the, the time series and, and the changes in time of day, we have to think about where things are changing on the map. And so I wanna highlight a couple of things we think we've learned about the geographic component of ridership during COVID. Uh, and these two maps are just kind of trying to illustrate before you squint too hard at them, uh, that we, uh, we are looking at these maps in pretty fine detail, generally at the census block group level. So it's pretty, finely disaggregated, um, looking at where um, transit demand is located right now. Next slide. The two, two of the uh, factors that we've found to be really important are on the left, uh, the percent of housing units in a census block that are occupied by renters. So versus some um, the um, occupants being homeowners, the occupants are renters. And on the right, the median household income by block group. And so both of these, uh, the more yellow color uh, represents areas that are likely to be more high propensity transit ridership areas. And so if you go to the next slide, what you'll see is sort of a uh, chart of where we looked at all of these in combination. And if you click forward one, it'll highlight those two factors as being some of the um, biggest ones that we found. Um, when we looked at controlling for the amount of service that was out there, this is really asking where is their demand propensity? And what can we say about the areas that have high demand propensity even during COVID? And really our conclusions uh, reflect economic need. And uh, so people that are renting and people that are of lower income are certainly the ones who are using transit at a much higher rate than those uh, that have, um, that are homeowners or that have higher income. So next slide, please. Oh, and you can go on more. So that so that kind of summarizes, you know, what we've seen about who is still using transit. I think one of the biggest questions, of course, is what about people who are not using transit? 
Uh, we've been trying to engage with that group as well, of course. And uh, one of the things that um, our, our colleagues did in marketing last fall was to, to take a sample of people who are regular riders on the system uh, that have given us their contact information through the GoTo go card um, system. So we kind of knew they were regular riders and we asked them, um, you haven't been on board you know, since COVID. When you think about coming back to Metro Transit, what is it that um, motivates you to think about, yeah, I'd, I think that would be a good reason to return. Uh, and, and what we found is that the most common answer was that people wanted to avoid traffic and parking hassles. And can you click forward one? It should underline a bit. I want to do one more. Ah, sorry, the, the text in the top is a little bit small to read, but it says among those with their own or shared access to a vehicle, that reason is even more prevalent at 53%. Essentially, we just we know that traffic and parking are motivators for people to use transit, especially those that have vehicle access. It's one of the things that people love about Metro Transit is it allows them to not worry about the daily grind of getting to and from uh, where they need to go. And most often, of course, we're thinking about a nine to five office commute there, but it's certainly not the only, only trip purpose that they have. So thinking about traffic and parking, uh, we have to immediately start thinking about telecommuting. And the role of telecommuting now in reducing the number of people who are simultaneously traveling to office parks, to downtown areas, to job centers. Uh, and that reduction, and of course, it's an open question what the long-term reduction is going to be, but that reduction is going to in turn impact traffic and parking hassles. It may or may not change the price of parking, but it may make parking more available. Um, traffic may not be what it was. Um, we're still not sure, but as uh, as Amy was hinting at, when we look at the general trends, um, we don't see the same sharp concentration of, of traffic happening in the peaks. And so that might be uh, lessening the motivators for people to use transit. And that's the bottom line here is that if, if people say their main motivations are traffic and parking, and we see a lot less traffic and parking hassles, uh, the conclusion has to be that the transit use is, is going to lag those problems. So that's kind of the approach we're taking in thinking about using data for planning. Can you go to the next slide, please? And that's, we're gonna look at these trends. We're looking at traffic and we're looking at parking. So we have the advantage of partnering with MnDOT uh, through their extensive sensor network that are in the roadways around the cities. Uh, and here we're highlighting that we can pull out actually entrance ramps uh, to the highway and exit ramps from the highway to downtown uh, Minneapolis on all sides. And we can look at the trends in those particular on and off ramps to see where there might be increases in traffic um, recently. And so these are data through last week. Uh, and each point here represents a, a particular day uh, for the inbound on the left and the outbound on the right. And what you can see is two things we've been talking about. One, the AM side on the left is lower than the outbound side on the right, the PM side on the right. And also there's differences among corridors. And I-94 seems to be um, experiencing a lot more traffic in and around downtown than some of the other corridors, uh, especially uh, the 35W south side. Next slide. So we're also looking at parking. So these data come to us from the city of Minneapolis. Um, we wanna thank them for their partnership as well, but they're able to look at for each um, day in a given parking facility that they control. Each dot here is, is the max percent utilization for that day. So whatever the peak demand for a parking was in those city ramps on a given day, that's what the dot represents. And then the trend is shown by that blue line. So what you can see is it looks a lot like commuter express ridership. There was a giant crash in March, 2020, and there hasn't been a really strong or sustained recovery. Um, the exceptions are interesting to look at. One exception in the top right of the panel there is the federal courthouse. You can see the, uh, the big bump that happened in spring of this year during the Chauvin trial. After that, it's gone back to declining. Uh, but maybe more interesting, uh, Ramp C and Riverfront there on the bottom row, both have a little bit more sustained um, increases over the past few months. And it's interesting because those reflect uh, more all-purpose trips. So those are not uh, connected so much to um, office facilities as they are, um, you know, for instance, the North Loop area for Ramp C. 
it's short-term parking, it's not contract parking. So what you're seeing there is a return of kind of all-purpose travel to downtown Minneapolis, much more so than a than a nine to five commute. And of course, if you if you get out your calendar and align the dates, you'll also see the the demand from the Twins games really elevating uh, ramp A and ramp B too. So next slide. Okay, the last data series that uh, we're watching with with uh, sharp eyes, and we'll hear more about in a minute are the number of cut trip alerts that we've been sending out. So we have a great new uh, transit information system where we can broadcast alerts in real time about trips that have to be cut due to you know, uh, issues with a disabled bus or um, not having the operators to run the service. And it's something that obviously we, you know, it's the first thing we try to avoid, but when it does happen, we like to be able to notify people of it. Uh, so we can actually look through time at how this is changing and. And for most of COVID, uh, we did not experience very many issues with meeting the schedule that we had we, we had promised. And recently, we've started to encounter um, a little bit higher spikes in days where we have to send out notices of late service or cut service. Uh, and and really, this comes back to uh, what Brian Funk will talk about in a minute, which is the number of operators that we have limits our ability to provide the service and. We can, um, you know, this goes back to the very first slide about we can't serve every trip everywhere. What trips can we serve? Well, first we have to know how many operators we have before we start to do that, do that allocation. So I'll quickly go through a few implications. Next slide, please. Of uh, of these trends. Next. Okay. So from the ridership trend, the takeaway should be uh, I think we should expect slow change in ridership. I don't think we should expect a spring back to that zero line, if you will, looking at that line, I think it's gonna be a uh, slow growth uh, and it's gonna depend on how sticky these behaviors are for people. And the best that we can do now, I think in transit is provide the supply we think will do well and measure the demand as people try to use it. And these ridership numbers are an aggregation of millions of different decisions by thousands and tens of thousands of people. So we, in some cases, the best thing we can do is provide the service and get people to consider it. Um, so we do have some potential perturbations that might do something like shift the shift the uh, behavior back to what it was before. You know, if you do see a massive increase in congestion from whatever reason, just people coming back to work from uh, other uh, issues, whether it's construction or something else, those are often good motivators for people to, to get back on board transit. If we do have any economic impacts, like a gas price spike for whatever reason, uh, that again, adding to the cost of driving can make people think positively about using transit. Uh, or if there are policy interventions, you know, to make driving and parking more expensive. Those are things that if transit uh, is to succeed might be something that is necessary to think about, but that's of course pretty far above my pay grade. Next. So for the thinking about the time of day, um, we're talking about trying to match the pattern here, which is all day, all purpose travel. It's not uh, easy to predict exactly how people are gonna use the network, which means you have to make it useful for everything. And that if we design our service specifically around a single purpose trip making like nine to five office commutes, it's really fragile. And this is a very old story in lots of different fields, but you know, from you know, thinking about nature and thinking about financial investments, Diversity is strength, right? So lots of different options means you're going to have robustness to disruption. And the more that you're tied to a single thing, the more fragile you are. Uh, and, and in the meantime, what we can do, in addition to you know getting that all-purpose travel supported with our network, is to improve the performance of that as we look at speed and reliability and partner with our local um, agencies, counties, and cities to um, help make that transit run really well. Next. Okay, then the last um, um, implication I want to describe before turning it over to Adam is to talk about the map. You know, we we know if we want to have pure ridership return on service, uh, we have a pretty good idea of where we should put that service. Even during COVID, while the kind of the rate of return on on investment may not be as high as it used to be, the relative areas on the map, well, we we know where those are. Uh, the flip side of that is if we are running service to areas that are more low propensity for whatever reason, 
then um, we shouldn't necessarily hold those to the same standard in terms of being as productive, but we it, it doesn't eliminate the need or the reason for serving those areas. There are lots of different reasons besides pure ridership return to be putting transit service out there. The other thing about the map concentrations, which we haven't dwelled on today at all, is that in some cases, the the highest propensity for ridership really does align with our equity mission, both in terms of economic opportunity, but also you know, historic disinvestment in communities of color tend to also show up on the map as places where there's higher propensity for ride. So to the extent that we can both um, serve current day transportation needs and, and also be more aligned with our equity mission, I think there are opportunities here. Next. Okay, so with that, I, I'm gonna turn over to Adam Harrington to talk about um, how these data are gonna inform our near-term service changes. Great, thanks, Eric. All of the data that Eric provided today is really a good backdrop for how we've been planning our service and what it looks like today and our steps forward. Next slide. So this would be a familiar couple of images for you, uh, but just to refresh, the image on the left of the screen, which is the map of the region, represents where our service concentrations are today. And since March of 2020, we've made several adjustments to our service network throughout that past 15 months, but we've always focused on those core service areas and that remains true today. And as illustrated by the chart on the right, we're basically providing 90 to 100% of our pre pandemic service levels on our local service and 25 to 30% on commuter express. So we're. We continue to be focused on those all day trips and finding ways to strengthen them both in our service delivery, but also in other ways, whether it be capital investments or bus stops. Next slide. Here's a map of the August 21st service changes. These are routes that will be having frequency improvements or our restored service. So we have 14 commuter express routes that we are returning to service or adding service to. So this isn't the complete picture of all the service necessarily, but it just is highlighting those areas that we're improving on August 21st. Our goal for the express network for commuters into the downtowns was really to provide a core route in each one of the corridors into the downtowns and something that we can build upon. These corridors all have strong park and ride locations, and we'll be anchoring off of them. And as Eric alluded to, we'll be monitoring the ridership and working continuously with our downtown partners to understand when people might be coming back more and more and how we can adjust our services to help do that. Uh, the other couple routes in here I'll point out are Route 3, there's a black line in the middle, and there'll be Frequency improvements to that will actually be adding to the high frequency network between Snelling Avenue and the North Loop in downtown Minneapolis. So we'll be extending that service and improving our bus stops along that corridor as well. Uh, also the Route 4 will be making some adjustments to this route between Silver Lake Village and New Brighton and Moundsview, looking at extending some local service to provide better job access and making a connection at Silver Lake Village. So uh, this gives an overview of where we're adding service for August 21st. And you may have noticed we've been trying to get the word out a little bit earlier than we normally do. We know that our customers uh, are trying to plan their lives for this fall primarily is what we've been hearing. And so trying to get that word out on where those improvements will be. Next slide. So this is a summary of those improvements I mentioned. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is as we watch and listen to our partners and businesses uh, in making these adjustments, we'll also be starting the 10 minute frequency on LRT a little bit earlier in the morning than it is today. And that will accommodate both rush hour traffic into the downtowns, but um, one of the large impetus for this is the University of Minnesota will be back in session and we wanna make sure that we provide good capacity for those routes. Uh, so when we've made these changes, we will still have 40 routes that will remain suspended. These are largely commuter express routes. 
And what we're hoping to do as we watch these trends is have the ability to add trips to those routes that we're returning to service that are really the anchors for each of these commuter express corridors on freeways and bringing that back as we have operators available. So this is a snapshot of what we're doing for August, but we also have a number of changes planned for December, some of which uh, you've heard a little bit about earlier, but we'll be coming back in a couple of weeks to talk more about those. Uh, but when we think about bringing back service, one of the important things is balancing the service that we deliver with the reliability of expecting it to be operated. So there's a juxtaposition between the lost trips slide that Eric showed and how much service we bring back and how many operators we have. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Funk to talk about our bus operator resources. Next slide. All right, thanks Adam and uh, Eric for, for the overview and lead in um, and for guests on the line, um, Brian Funk, uh, act, acting chief. I'm gonna just sort of give you a highlights of where we're at today, what we're doing. And I have a special introduction to wrap up my portion of the presentation. Next slide, please. All right, so as Adam uh, and Eric um, there's not really a sense in the street if we're not going to be able to reliably operate that. We, uh, because we're users of the system that when we put service out, it needs to be there every single day without fail. Uh, there's lots of reasons why a bus may not be a scheduled trip, but uh, as an agency, we take it and need to make sure that reliability is a cornerstone of what we're doing. Promises fulfilled to the highest degree possible. I think Brian, your audio is cutting out a little bit. Uh, next slide. All right, thanks. I'll speak up here. And so uh, one of the key measures that we have here at Metro uh, be able to tell you how we're doing our resources is to look at the number of employees full time and also part time weekday. Right now, during our current uh, service schedule, is 1,186 and our actual uh, 1,163. Um, not uh, exactly where we want to be. However, as I'll show you, uh, it's a better position than we have been uh, years. And so moving into August, we're going to see a increase. Adam's team did a masterful job of being able to both add service, but also uh, redistribute then um, our labor agreement to add that service and have a, a huge increase in the number of operator resources uh, that are going to need to be deployed on the street. And so our number actually bumped up slightly for our number of students in training, which is additional uh, folks start today. Uh, we have uh, applicants who are in that later stage of the hiring. Um, and we have a goal of 12 for each of our bi week. I'll, I'll show you why that is here on the next slide, please. So this chart showing you over the last three years, our operator staffing, uh, which currently is that 1186 uh, versus our actual. And so uh, Elf and others have briefed you before, but you can see that several years we've been understaffed and uh, started March, the scheduled March 2020 pick for about 120 operators below our ideal level. Big spikes with uh, a lot of service customers experience illustrated by Eric earlier in the day. The bottom fell out uh, as we all remember. So that we needed to plan, uh, provide every day in down to just over a thousand uh, of those operators. And our staffing stayed about the same. And so while we're, um, our operators continued to uh, work with us and for us, uh, we had to possible thing and we slowed down hiring while attrition through with demand. And so we monitored that very closely through 
And as we saw those lines start to come a little bit closer to, you know, we jump started the process again uh, over the winter with our advertising starting in about February before August. Um, and now we're just, but we think we're going to uh, have some things in place to come back. So, next slide. All right, and uh, and finally, here's the, what we're doing about it uh, phase. And so uh, we have refreshed uh, on our team, our marketing campaign, and we're hitting, you know, the tried and true social media, um, working through and, and putting articles to flyers to job organizations and working through our, our connections. Um, we're also working on giving business operators with QR codes so that they're able to be those ambassadors and cash in on some of the referral bonus um, available. Uh, we're working on paid social media um, through our partners like Move Minnesota, Pop-Up, um, and then really what we found is that there's a couple of help us uh, identify and drive quality uh, potential employees to our doorstep through employee referrals. And so working really hard uh, leverage the talent that we have in house and within the communities that we're serving. Um, employees are able to uh, acquire a referral bonus. Thing else, they're able to bring in high quality, good people, $1,000 hiring bonus. Now, it should be no, uh, our industry, like many industries, uh, is in a right now. Uh, we're competing for a limited workforce. We have seen uh, driving careers continue to be one of the more, um, specialties that are out there. We need quality. Uh, it does not make any sense uh, for Metro Transit to bring in anybody. Uh, this isn't a job that just anybody can do. Uh, we have a lot of things going uh, for us. We have an um, apprenticeship program for people when they do tour and uh, are able to have a connection and pay but the most important thing is to be able to get that interest for so through a streamlined hiring process uh, we're going to, uh, as the general manager mentioned at the outset event this coming saturday at our training center on north 7th so uh, those are just a few of the highlights and then finally i promised i want to introduce you um amina line amina is uh her regular full-time manager at the MJR garage. I mean, it's been an employee for about 14 years, uh, and she's now a uh, deputy director in the bus transportation area, uh, taking on a, a great responsibility, high profile position here for the operations side of the house to really uh, evaluate, uh, do a thorough review of in doing the last several years, uh, what we need to be doing moving forward with human resources, marketing, and then our internal well, um, to ensure that when we do attract uh, talent, we're able to uh, get them started and, and off. So happy to have Amina taking a lead role in this. And with that, I think unless you wanted to add anything, I think any of us could stand for questions. Very good. Thank you all and congratulations, Amina. Um, glad to have you in this role. Um, any questions or comments from council members? Council member Fredson. Thank you and congratulations to Amina also. Uh, just a, uh, this probably is a question for Eric, right? But on slide 12, um, one of the questions we asked folks were important reasons to return to transit. I'm just wondering if we asked the question in terms of, you know, why haven't you returned to transit? We've heard a lot about safety. Obviously we share concerns about safety and I'm just wondering if, if we ask that question, um, the second, uh, or if we felt like it was a false premise, the second is, and I think it's smart to make adjustments here, um, just based on sort of our return to, to so-called normal. Um, uh, also, would, you know, I'm interested to know what folks' thoughts are as it relates to, you know, before we were to make any kind of drastic changes, I think there just needs to be a, a, a longer period of time to, to really see what kind of uh, impacts COVID has had on long-term ridership, and uh, this was referenced, right? But you know, specifically the uh, return to uh, work, sort of uh, uh, starting at Labor Day. I think for a lot of both private sector 
businesses, also government. You know, I know uh, most folks I know at the city of St. Paul still are working from home, and, and I think you'd see uh, 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 sort of spikes connected to to folks working in government and um, uh, post Labor Day. Uh, so just kind of uh, interested to know what what uh, timeline you think we would need to assess prior to making any kind of more significant adjustments. And I'm Chair, Chair uh, Councilmember Fredson, I, I'll start just by saying we did ask people about their perspectives on safety. We, the survey that uh, was run was in uh, fall 2020. So a lot of the questions about why haven't you come back were, were more around, are you actually traveling anywhere or are you still teleworking 100% of the time and so forth? We did ask people about their perspectives on safety. And of course, there were um, you know, people that give us dimensions of COVID safety and people give us dimensions of personal safety and security. Uh, both those are important to people. Um, I think when, uh, and, and you know, our agency is definitely focused on making sure that it's a safe trip in every dimension, um, that that's one of the things we're offering. Um, but I think what the focus of my, I guess, uh, data dive, if you will, is is more the structural pieces of the travel behavior and and whether people are even open to the decision before they get to, well, wait, I have to think about safety. It's sort of like, is there a trip that matches their um, need, if that makes sense? And to that, to that extent, thinking about post Labor Day, uh, we know we're going to get um, a bump in college associated travel as University of Minnesota and other places are back in session. We know that our high school service is going to be running again. Uh, we know there's going to be certainly lots of people that are changing their travel patterns and getting unstuck from what we've been doing the last 15 months. And that is an opportunity for us to 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 make those trips kind of get sticky on our, on our system. And we want to do that. I think, though, that you're right. It's going to be more of a slow climb than a than a spring back, if I can put it that way. So I don't know if there are others from Metro Transit wanted to comment on that. I was just going to add that we're going to be watching the trends of the next nine to 12 months before we do anything drastic. And, you know, I mentioned that we still have 40 routes suspended. We haven't made any hard decisions about them because we really want to see what happens, particularly this fall and into next spring to help us determine what our next steps forward are after that. Madam Chair, this is Wes. I would just add that, that, uh, you know, we are the next uh, part of this presentation at the next, uh, Transportation Committee meeting will be about some of the things that we're going to be doing as we emerge from, and, and I think that it will in part answer Council Member Fredson's uh, questions. In terms of safety, we're certainly putting a lot of focus on safety. We need to put a lot of focus on safety with what's going on right now. We'll be talking a lot more about that uh, later. Uh, we're looking at marketing that we would introduce in, in September. You'll be hearing more about that. Uh, we're looking at, at service at this as an opportunity to look at how we might redesign services as we go forward uh, and certainly have opportunities to test some things to see how they work. Perhaps uh, uh, that includes perhaps uh, 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 providing uh, not providing services to every express park and ride, but consolidating services to certain park and rides and then improving the service once you get there. It's those sorts of ideas that we're looking at and we'll be talking more about uh, in part two of this presentation. Councilmember Fredson. One, one quick follow up on that. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I, for, uh, so the legislature, uh, of course, required or, or um, in partnership, we're moving forward with the study of both express routes and North Star. And I can't remember if there was a timeline associated with that. Do we know that off the top of our heads or not? Um, Chair Barber and Councilmember Fredson, I, I think I have it in my in my head, but I don't want to say a guess out loud in public. So I'll get that to you. That, that'd be that'd be a safer bet. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, how competitive and how are we competitive at Metro Transit with when the school districts start? Um, hiring for the, the next school uh, session that will be starting up as well. And do we see much leaving? We, you know, we're 
the hiring bonus is great, the employee referral bonus is great, all of the things that we're doing are terrific um, for hiring full-time. Do we see people then shift, move? Do we compete? How do we compete? How do we compare with pay benefits, things like that? Mayor, Council Member Cummings, are you able to hear me any better now? I understand out a little bit before. You're still cutting out a little bit. Okay. Well, I'll I'll try that as best I can, which is that we're in a continuous mode evaluating where we stand within the marketplace, uh, ways that we're able to differentiate ourselves. Um, right now, our our driving need is for the full time match the service curve that we have uh, as Eric uh, talked about those high peaks during a shower uh, are at least temporarily suppressed. Uh, we're trying to hire for those full time jobs, which comes with. Access to uh, benefits in addition to our pay. The thing that we really need to sell is that our pay scale. It might be sort of right, you know, at the same as. Organizations. That includes 5% step every year until top scale and top scale is still ahead. Um, you know, our competitors. Madam chair, maybe just to add or fill in the blanks or the breakup uh, a little bit that that. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're really dealing a little bit. I think Mr. Fox saying we're dealing a little bit with a different market right now than the schools because we're looking for full time. Uh, staff. And we have an excellent benefit package and we have excellent wage wages and progression of wages as, as we go through. Uh, so, you know, in the past, we've actually uh, been hiring more for our hires have been more to start as part time and then go to full time, which which we always felt was a little bit of a disadvantage. Now we're hiring for full time positions because we can't we don't have enough operators that are part time that want to move to full time. So. You know, we're, we're, I think we're just going to try to keep getting out there with these events and keep, keep doing these on a regular basis and try to hire as many operators as possible. I've, we've talked about over hiring on operators. And by that, I mean, when you're understaffed, you can afford to be a little overstaffed in moments and still keep within your budget. And we're trying to be smart about that and, uh, and anticipate the ebbs and flows of the, of the workplace market and and try to better position ourselves because the bottom line when it comes to operators is that that people want service reliability and so we're not going to promise services unless we think we can deliver them i think that's better than trying to over promise and then under underperform so that's that's the approach that we're taking to this and we're trying to be aggressive in the hiring thank you thank you are there additional questions or comments Councilmember Chambliss. Um, I just want to um, express my appreciation for giving us a very detailed update on how the service has changed and um, how it's going to be monitored going forward. I'm looking forward to seeing um, what's going to happen after the fall with transportation. And I'm really happy about the fact that uh, we have these opportunities for full time jobs. As bus drivers, I'll be sending out some information about that personally as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Reva. You captured my thoughts perfectly. Um, uh, really, thank you to Eric, Adam, and Brian. We really appreciate you guys keeping coming back to the committee. I think it's so important how we uh, ramp service back up and how we emerge on the other side of this pandemic. And so um, all of the information you're providing us is very much appreciated. Um, so I'll give out a final call. Is there any other questions? Comments? All right, thank you guys. Have a good night. All right, now we are on to our next information item, which is the regional solicitation in each projects development process update. We have Cole Hineker here. Good afternoon, council members. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm um, giving you an update on something that we presented a few months ago, uh, but prior to the time in which a work group uh, of TAB started meeting to talk about unique projects of which council member uh, Fredson and, and Barber were, were members of. So we're giving an update today on what the majority of the conclusions of that work group were, uh, and we'll be presenting this to TAB 
uh, in about two weeks. And so Council Member Barber could bring any feedback that you may all have uh, from today's presentation on the recommendations. So I'll also let them chime in if they want on any of the how the committee went. But next slide, please. So a little bit of a reminder here on what the regional solicitation is. It's our process to distribute flexible federal funds to local projects that support our region's goals for transportation. And so it's about 200 million every two years. It's not a small amount of money. And it's generally looking at projects four to five years out. So it's not uh, trying to pick or solve solutions of the problems that are tomorrow or even next year. It's really looking out four to five years and trying to get ahead of the needs of the transportation system. And TAB has always been very appreciative of how technical this process is. It tries to utilize a lot of metrics uh, and a lot of data and input from technical staff from around the region. And so the unique projects is a little bit of a step away from that, and I'll cover that today. And then uh, federal awards generally pay 80% of the project cost. And we have a lot of maximum project awards of uh, you know, anywhere from three and a half to, to 10 million for the different categories. So it's a pretty significant amount of money for a project to achieve uh, getting awarded a, a, an application. Uh, next slide. And uh, you know we do always try to link the regional solicitation back to our, our Thrive outcomes and our TPP goals. I'll, I'll, I think you'll see today that uh, a substantial amount of the, the recommendations tie back to things that are very front and center for the council today. Um, and then, you know, we always look at geographic balance as a secondary lens. You know, TAB is very interested in making sure the whole region feels like they're part of the solicitation. And I think they took that lens also down to the unique projects category, and you'll see how that got reflected in the scoring. Uh, next slide. So a really brief reminder, we did cover this the last presentation, but unique projects have historically been uh, sort of an as needed case by case basis. Uh, there was a, a brief application category a few years ago. Uh, it didn't elicit the kind of project suggestions that I think TAB was really looking for. So they abandoned the, the, the idea of a unique projects category. Uh, but in 2018, we got a very interesting application uh, that really didn't know where to apply. They actually applied, and this is St. Paul and our car, uh, a, a project that was really collaborative along with XL Energy to install charging stations and, and provide uh, shared mobility or shared use cars around St. Paul and, and in Minneapolis as well. They didn't really know where to apply, uh, and so it kind of raised this issue to tab of if we have this project that we think is really good, how can we better accommodate it within our solicitation, recognizing that they have somewhat rigid categories for what where projects can apply? And so they had some recommendations as part of a work group that met in 2019 um, to create a unique projects category and set aside a certain portion in the 2020 solicitation, uh, which you all adopted the projects for uh, earlier this year. And moving into what what essentially would be we're going to solicit for these projects in 2022, but we're going to set aside the money uh, last uh, last cycle. And so they wanted to then use the, the interim year to establish how these, these projects would be evaluated and set the framework for applicants. And so that's what this work group was, was working on over the last few months. Um, I think you can go two slides ahead. Might be a break slide here. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Sorry. Back one slide, please. Uh, just a, a note that, as you can see here, these are all the different categories that the uh, regional solicitation has under the three modal categories. There's a variety of different application types that you can submit, um, including the arterial bus rapid transit project that was created uh, in 2020. But the unique projects is, is taken off the top. Um, it is one of the sources that we use to fund the travel behavior inventory in our modeling program. Uh, but it, there, there's about five, four to five million that's going to be available for this uh, category when we solicit uh, next year. And so that's what we're really talking about is how do we how do we select projects for that four to five million within this category? Uh, and, and really, how do they relate to all the other categories that are eligible for projects to apply under? Uh, so next slide. So we had a group that met. Uh, we met five times between April 23rd and just last Friday, July 9th was our was our final meeting. 
Um, it's mostly comprised of TAB members uh, with Barber and, and Fredson as our alternate serving on the committee. Uh, we had four county representatives, county commissioners. We had three uh, city representatives and then five council appointed citizen and, and modal representatives. And so their their ta their task was really to, to provide some high level policy direction so that technical staff staff can develop more details for this category, create an actual application, which if you've ever seen them, you know, in some cases they're 15 pages long. Uh, so we do need to do a lot more work after this this policy group wraps up, but we have a good framework to move forward with, and that's what really what we wanted this policy work group to do. Uh, they met for about an hour and a half every Friday morning. So, so kudos to all of them, or every other Friday morning. It was it's a it's a big ask, and I and I think it was really productive time that we spent with that group. Um, next slide. So, on to what they recommended. Um, we can go on to the next slide. A couple of things they wanted to cover up front. Um, there was some questions about what. What does eligibility for unique projects mean? And I think there was some understanding from TAB that it meant that you couldn't apply in the other categories. And it it really creates a difficult issue for, for staff to have to make the call on whether a project would be, would be eligible in another category or not. Um, you know, it, it could be that a project is a, a mobility hub at a transit station and, and in the past we'd funded those under the transit category. But in reality, they, they kind of serve more as unique projects. They bring together a lot of different modes and a lot of different access points. So that's just one example of a difficult project to determine eligibility on. So we're actually recommending that any type of project could apply under unique projects, uh, but that the evaluation criteria really should determine whether you fit the, the goal and the purpose of the unique projects or not. And you'll see what that means um, as we get into the details. But we do have a purpose statement here that we want unique projects to be uh, projects that fund, or sorry, a, a program that funds innovative projects that would not be eligible or competitive in other application categories uh, and that reduce environmental impacts, improve racial equity, and support multimodal communities. Uh, those last three points are really the big goals of the program. And because they're not as strongly emphasized in some of the other application categories, that really should be the determinant for an applicant as to whether they want to apply as a unique project or as say a transit or a bike project, um, as well as whether they, they just don't really fit into those other categories um, as a project type. And so we also have a two-step application process. So we think an early step of applicants wanted to check in and ask staff to make uh, somewhat of a qualitative judgment call on whether they'd fit better in one application category or not. We can, we can provide that feedback prior to them going through the rigorous uh, application process. Uh, next slide. So uh, in terms of the timeline for unique projects, it's gonna be a little bit unique um, because we are proposing a two-step application process. This is uh, not something that the regional solicitation has ever really done. Um, so the first step is that we'll be uh, putting out the regional solicitation for public comment uh, later this year in September. Uh, and that public comment period will be open through uh, about mid-November. But overlapping with that, with that public comment period is we're gonna ask potential applicants to submit a project interest form, in which they, they provide some high level information on their application and, and we'll give them feedback on it. Um, that just allows us to meet timelines that we can consult with applicants uh, for a few months to give them feedback on their project, perhaps you know answer any questions about eligibility and then release uh, the actual solicitation in February of 2022. And then applicants would be uh, basically along the same timelines as the normal regional solicitation. And then they would be evaluated in the summer of next year and then projects would be selected later that year. And again, for unique projects, we're really looking at projects that are two to th three years out. So 2024 to 2025 timeframe for in implementation. Uh, next slide. So in the first step of the application, we're, we're thinking you know, something along the lines of uh, a page or two application submittal where the applicants provide a basic description of what they're proposing, a list of their, their project elements and a budget, uh, and then a description of where the project would be or who's, what populations are impacted by the project. And then a brief answer to each of the six, six questions that are criteria, um, not meant to be an elaborate answer at this point, but just to give us a sense for how they're thinking this project would meet 
the goals of the unique projects uh, category. And I'll go over those six uh, on, a, on a subsequent slide. Staff would really be the, the primary audience for this first step to, to review the project for eligibility and provide technical feedback to the potential applicants. Um, and this is really an optional step for applicants to get some feedback and, and maybe answer some questions about their project that they wouldn't want to put out there uh, after going through the whole application process. Uh, we potentially would share this information with the policy work group that met over the last few months as a subset of TAB, uh, but we, we do have to kind of respect confidentiality in this first stage and not wanting to give any applicant a leg up by being able to see the, the other potential applicants. So we're still kind of working through that detail, but it's it's a good first step for applicants to get some insights on where they could either um, make a determination on where they should apply, but also get some feedback on ways they might be able to improve their project and make it more competitive. Uh, next slide. The second evaluation process, and this is during the formal evaluation of all regional solicitation projects next summer, uh, would be uh, very typical to our, our typical or our um, other application categories to have a very detailed description of project, including their need and how they plan to approach the implementation, um, a more line, line item budget with the matches sources confirmed. Um, so they, they have to have letters of support from any potential match partner, uh, detailed description of the project location and affected populations, and then much more elaborate responses to the evaluation questions that we're looking for, including any data that they can provide to support the claims that they're making in their application. So a kind of qualitative and quantitative combined response to our questions. Uh, at this, and this is very unique, uh, the regional solicitation policy work group members are actually going to be the, the evaluators of these applications. Um, we, heard, we heard a lot from the policy work group members that while they can give us general guidance on some of these evaluation criteria, it might be a sort of, you know it when you see it uh, level of evaluation. And so we want to give them the ability to, to weigh in on, you know, is, is this a project that is innovative? Is it a project that is addressing environmental concerns in a way that you guys had in your mind? And it gives them the flexibility to, to set out a framework for their evaluation, but really to apply it once they see the types of projects that they get. Um, the technical staff would still serve a really important role of reviewing it for errors or providing some high level input, uh, but really allowing the, the policy work group members to have a more active role in project evaluation. You know, the way it works in, in the normal solicitation is the technical staff all evaluate projects and we submit a ranked uh, project list to TAB to, to, to use in their project selection process. So this is putting TAB at the forefront of the scoring process. So very unique, but we think it's gonna be a really important and helpful step for this program. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the criteria that, that the work group is recommending, we're using six uh, primary criteria to evaluate projects. And they're posed as questions here. Um, how does the project reduce adverse environmental impacts of transportation? Really looking at things like air quality, water quality, I mean, even things like noise and light pollution. And so that'll be something that the applicant will have to talk about how their project would do that. Uh, and this is uh, based on our meeting on Friday, this is the second rated criteria that TAB emphasizes. So it's really one of the focal points of their uh, unique projects asked this round. The second criteria uh, here is how does the project improve racial equity? And so a lot of discussion amongst the work group about connectivity, access barriers you know making sure that that segments of the population that have had barriers to access that we're addressing those in this project um, and even things like engagement um, how are our uh, different population groups engaged through this effort um, and and i think we even go down to the level of what 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 is the makeup or what is the ownership structure of your partners that you're bringing to the table so a pretty broad ranging uh, focus on equity and a much more highly emphasized focus than any of the other uh, application categories. Um, the, the third one here is how does the project support multimodal communities? So really looking at both, um, how does it support bikeable, walkable, and transit friendly communities, um, and including can it support multiple of those modes in its project? So is it truly multimodal in that it brings modes together and allows people to connect between them? 
uh, but also how does it um, use land use strategies to advance the multimodal communities? So things like parking strategies or um, designing for density that is context specific or context sensitive. Um, I think we're we're also considering first last mile solutions within this category, uh, which is a an area of of need that always comes up from partners and always comes up at TAB. So they really want to emphasize that here. Uh, and then the fourth one here, and it's actually the highest rated uh, criteria from a weighting perspective, is that TAB really does want a project that's innovative. And this 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 really it's hard to define, but I think that. The way we're defining it is just something that's a new idea to the region or that solves a problem that's been long standing in the region with a new approach. Um, so it, this this is probably the category that has the most, you know it when you see it, uh, lens that's going to be applied to it. But it is uh, the one that Tab really said was the most important for them to move forward with uh, as, a, as a top ranking criteria. They, they do want this to be innovative category. Uh, the, the fifth one is how does the project have regional impact or could it be expanded to more of the region? So this is that regional balance, geographic balance question. Um, a project is going to get more points if it can affect more people or more parts of the region. Um, and it could also get points if it's just a pilot in one location, but it has the ability to expand and be applied to more of the region over time if the pilot proves successful. Um, so that's an important factor. And then the last one there is how does the project build partnerships or collaboration? And so the, the idea here is both are they bringing a lot of different partners, diverse partners to the table to help deliver this project um, to build those relationships? And then also are they bringing in a lot of different matching sources or are they having a high percentage of match to uh, bring more dollars to the table where you kind of spread the risk of amongst multiple partners? Um, so those are what, and again, the, the work group just really had a, a conversation about this on Friday. We're bringing the, the details of this tab uh, in a couple of weeks. The metrics are a lot more detailed. I, I kind of described them in qualitative terms today, but we'll, we'll certainly be developing more detail on those metrics moving forward for the application. Next slide. Uh, a couple of other rules just to wrap up the recommendations here. They, as I said, there is about four to five million available and, and the work group decided that there really shouldn't be a limit. Uh, so that means that one application, if it were good enough, could receive all of the, the money in this category. Um, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be the case, but it's they did not set a project limit uh, for this first round. <clears throat> but they did say that if we're gonna get a lot of small applications, they would like them to be 500,000 or more just to ensure that we're, we're being cost effective stewards of the federal dollars. Um, it can be a lot of administrative work to handle eight applications of you know, 500,000. So uh, to do more than that would be, would be a lot of work for um, uh, a number of different projects. And then, um, as I said, match requirements are gonna be uh, considered as part of scoring, but otherwise projects would only be expected to meet the minimum 20%. Uh, and there was some conversation about whether we should combine this with TDM funding pot that is in the regional solicitation, and they just recommended that we keep them separate for now, uh, given that the council is embarking on a, a TDM regional study and that we should wait for the recommendations of that study to be complete before doing anything with that pot of money. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the next steps, uh, we are gonna be actually presenting this for the first time as recommendations to TAB, uh, on, as I said, on J uh, July 21st. And then we'll, we'll proceed to also go to the technical committees to get their input, um, particularly from the technical perspective in July and August. And um, we'll then be finalizing the application materials based on any feedback that re we receive at those meetings in the August to early September timeframe. And then we'll release the application materials for public comment uh, in September, along with that, as I said, that initial call for project interest from applicants. So if you, this in particular interest to, to you all, if you know of a potential applicant or a, a project that you think might be interested in this, this type of funding, certainly start putting it on their radar and you can put them in, in contact with council staff if they wanna ask any more questions right now, uh, but that's, the next step, um, I think the last slide is maybe just my contact info. Yep, so um, it's been a great pleasure to work with this work group and I, 
I'm sure Council Member Barber and Fredson can can say that it was a I think it was a really productive time spent, but would welcome any other questions that council members have this time. Thank you, Cole. Council Member Chambliss. Uh, thanks for that presentation. Um, you know, re regional solicitation funds uh, and opportunities are always exciting uh, to see what people come up with. Um, and my question is related to the evaluation criteria on page 12. Um, and um, adding the building partnerships or collaborations, I think that is a really important criteria. Um, and, you know, the, the collaboration, um, I think, and partnerships should also have, um, in all of these criteria, actually, do we have um, some points of evaluation so that we can determine um, and strengthen accountability? I'm not sure if, if, if that would mean, you know, periodic um, reviews of, of people who have received the funding or even staging the um, distribution of dollars based on meeting um, the criteria. So if you could address that. And, and secondly, I'd like to talk about um, the uh, groups um, stressing the uh, project innovative criteria. I know that's come up with the LCA criteria. And um, one of the um, things that I think needs to really be looked at with in innovative um, I think we should also kind of list, and you stated it, that um, not just being innovative, but um, enhancing existing best practices, I think is really important. Um, if, if the focus is always on, you know, who is creating the most new or most new, that's not the right grammar, but you know what I mean, <laughs> um, or the most innovative, uh, projects, it may um, not provide incentives for projects that are utilizing best practices. Um, and best practices shows continuous improvement. It's really hard to have continuous improvement if every cycle uh, we're doing new and innovative things. You know, what are we building off of? So. Um, if if they could have points for both, that would be great. And I know Deb and um, Fredson can maybe chime in on this since they were part of that discussion. Um, if I can um, add just a little of context, I think that's why like we wanted to. We have the overall regional solicitation, which we really are focused on best projects, best practices, but we wanted to have the ability to be able to innovate, to be leaders, and and ahead of ahead of other regions and coming up with new ideas and ways to do things. And so that's why this sort of smaller set of funding was set aside. And, you know, really, like, we want to be innovative, but we also want to accomplish the, the group really talked a lot about the key goals that we wanted to have projects that both um, would be directed at reduce, reducing adverse environmental impacts and improving racial equity. And so um, we this is the reason why this money was like allocated under the last solicitation and being um, awarded um, later because some of you can't have innovation on a project that has five, is five years out. You're not going to be innovative. And so, um, yes, I still agree that one of the things we also talked about was being able to scale it and apply it in other places, um, which um, is across the region even if it was a targeted project and that does require best practices and that is certainly something that we talked about so i'd say it's a little bit of both to be able to be successful in this category but i think some of the discussions as we go through and, and actually do some of the scoring some of this will kind of um, work itself out as we look at what actually comes into us but um, definitely agree we want it something that yes is innovative but can be replicated and can or or it could be scalable so and that would require using best practices so. well do you have anything to add yeah um when i do think that you know within the category of best practices there's certainly opportunity to bring best practices to this region for the first time and that's mm -hmm. i think a lot of what tab has in mind is uh, you know an, an area that's already developed somewhere else but maybe bringing it to this region um in terms of your question about um the partnerships you know one of the 
things that we, we do want to emphasize in the project is the ability to evaluate, to self-evaluate your program. And so we haven't written the criteria yet, but I think we would emphasize that across all of the different categories. You know, how do you propose to, to evaluate your impact on the environment? How do you propose to evaluate equity as part of your project? So really leaving it up to the applicants to propose that and, and using that as part of our scoring uh, guidance. But, and this is actually a, a nice uh, segue into the next conversation that we'll have that we always do a, a before and after study of the solicitation to see about what types of impacts do our projects have after they're implemented. And so we haven't talked about how do you, you know, integrate unique projects yet because they're still a few years out, but we'll certainly have that conversation in a couple of years. Okay, great, thank you. Perfect, any other questions or comments from council members? All right, thanks Cole, appreciate it. Um, we do have one more um, uh, information item. I know we're pushing up towards six, but this should only take about 15 minutes and it ties in really well to what Cole was just talking about of the before and after study of the regional solicitation. Um, if, uh, as long as everyone's uh, in agreement, we are with moving ahead with that, we could do that. If objections, raise your hand now. <laughs> um, I just have a, event, a Met Council related event to go to at seven. So I may have to sneak out a little okay. early. All right, like I said, it should take about 15 minutes. So, um, uh, but then if you do have questions, by all means, please reach out to Dave and he will um, get um, get back in touch with you. Um, all right, so we have, the next one is the regional solicitation before and after study. And we have Dave Burns here. Hey, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'll try to make this as quick as possible. Um, Make sure you guys get out of here and get some dinner. Uh, today, I'll be providing an overview of the major findings of the regional solicitation before and after study part two. So uh, as a bit of background, this study kicked off in the spring of 2020 and we completed the final do document last month. So overall, the study will assist the council and our stakeholders in determining if the criteria used in the regional solicitation are successful in garnering the desired outcomes and to help perform poten inform potential changes to future solicitations. So phase one of this project was completed in 2019. And one of the key recommendations as part of this study of phase one of the study was to develop a project database. So this database, which was actually a key task within um, this phase, phase two of the study, helps us to better understand whether our criteria may need to be tweaked in future solicitations. Um, another recommendation from phase one of the study was to conduct a comprehensive peer review of other MPOs in the country and document their processes for distributing funds within their region and kind of see what we can learn from that and glean from it. This was also uh, fulfilled in phase two of this study and the results are codified in the final report. So the work from phase one of the st study really prompted greater interest in how the regional solicitation application process could be improved and streamlined. So that's really where the, uh, uh, the idea of doing a phase two of this study stems from. Oh, uh, next slide, please. So uh, the project team consisted of um, uh, Lance Bernard from HKGI, Ashley, Hudson from Bolton Menk was the main sub uh, sub on the contract and I was the project manager for the council. Next slide, please. Okay, um, the main objectives of this phase two of the study were to sort of refine the approach for monitoring the after conditions of project that, projects that have been funded by the regional solicitation. Again, the purpose of this was to evalu evaluate whether we are meeting our desired outcomes as a region. Uh, so this was done by measuring the benefits of funded projects by comparing the before conditions with the after conditions. It also includes recommendations for tools and data sets that we could use to continue to monitor the conditions of completed projects. Another uh, key um, objective of the study was to research ways to streamline and improve the application process. 
So in order to do this, we leverage focus groups consisting of both consultants with a lot of experience preparing these applications and discuss some of the positive and negative feedbacks of uh, their experience with the application process. A specific task that I wanna point out is uh, it include, uh, included examining the existing multi-use trail usage criteria and vis-a-vis -vis the criteria used by other MPOs for prioritizing bike and ped project applications. Some of the other things that we looked at in the study is uh, we were interested in examining the fate of projects which actually did not receive regional solicitation funding. Uh, we wanted to know specifically were they resubmitted during a later uh, or a future solicitation? Did they move forward without regional solicitation funding? So basically to answer the overall question, to what extent does the successful procurement of these regional solicitations solicitation funds impact whether a project will be constructed? Next, we wanted to understand some of the factors that can cause a project from being built on time or altogether. Are revisions needed specifically to the risk assessment criteria in order to prevent projects from being withdrawn or delayed in the future? And we also wanted to simplify the process and develop a list and how-to guide of crash modification factors in order to allow uh, applicants to easily select and apply the crash modification factor that best fits the application. Um, oh, next slide, please. So uh, some of the overall findings is uh, combined. Um, we, we looked at the 2014, 2016, 2018, and 2020 cycles. Uh, we garnered over 538 grant applications, which totaled $1.87 billion in requested funds. And the regional solicitation um, provided nearly half of the requested funds, um, totaling 782 million over the four cycles, which I just mentioned. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, as I just noticed, noted, the first task of the study was to gather data and populate this regional solicitation project database. Um, most of the after data came from projects from the 2014 regional solicitation, which were primarily constructed between 2017 and 2019. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as you might expect, obtaining reliable after conditions proved uh, problematic. Uh, data from 2020 and 2021, because of COVID-19, uh, were unlikely to accurately portray the effects of the project's construction due to the significant decline in traffic volumes and transit ridership during the period. Um, because of these data constraints, uh, we place more emphasis on uh, kind of putting the methodology uh, in place uh, to measure the before and after conditions in the future. So this project really helped us to create the framework for measuring before and after conditions moving forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, one thing we consistently heard from our applicants was that our current congestion measure is uh, a little bit difficult for applicants to determine and requires the use of a software uh, called Synchro. So Synchro is uh, fairly cost prohibitive and often requires professional consulting firms to perform an analysis just for the solicitation application, which can be quite costly. Um, in order to examine sort of an alternative to the use of Synchro for this kind of congestion measure, uh, the project team did an analysis of congestion using data available from the Streetlight Insight platform. Um, as you can see from the results of this table, um, uh, which has a summary, uh, uh, blah, sorry, uh, which includes a summary of projects from the 2014 solicit solicitation, uh, Streetlight data was able to, to gather, um, you know, good quality information on uh, the before and after 
um, results of the projects. Um, this really kind of helped confirm that the use of this data set, which is easier to process and currently available from the council, could be a viable alternative to the synchro analysis. So our overall recommendation uh, was that uh, we should perhaps consider using a big data source such as Streetlight or perhaps another vendor um, for the before and after congestion conditions. Um, and this also better aligns with our congestion management process. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, safety, uh, actually in this project, we uh, developed a customized GIS tool, um, which we created to automate monitoring and reporting the safety results. So ultimately, this is going to help us determine whether the completed project the project shows that we have uh, that they are having the intended positive effect on safety. So it's kind of a screenshot of uh, this tool um, that was developed as part of the study. Um, the tool depicts the data through a GIS dashboard uh, for built roadway projects that have received federal transportation funds, and it includes information on total crashes, fatal crashes, serious injury crashes, fatal uh, and serious injury crash rate, uh, bicycle and pedestrian crashes, and then also a, a crash cost um, aspect of the tool and the overall crash rate. Um, again, we don't have a lot of completed um, projects to uh, show off on this, but um, it's, it's very important in determining whether the safety criteria may need to be altered in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, just a limited number of projects that have sufficient after data to see the true effects of this is a small sample size. In general, we are seeing that they are um, improving the safety uh, um, overall. Next slide, please. So digging more into the projects not awarded regional solicitation funds, um, got some numbers here, 42% 40, of the funding requests were for, fulfilled over the past four cycles, uh, which amounted to 782 million. So that leaves 313 projects that remain unfunded. So some projects move forward without regional solicitation funds, but often projects are being scaled back or you know fewer amenities enhancements including like sidewalks and other pedestrian and bicycle facilities or delayed until funding is secured so applica applications that did not receive funding for a given solicitation but resubmitted at a future solicitation had kind of varying success in their resubmittal efforts with approximately 29% eventually receiving funding. Um, it might not even be fair to call that varying success. That's a fairly low success rate um, for uh, applicant, applicants who uh, are denied and apply in the future. Um, next slide, please. And in terms of uh, non-motorized summary, uh, we also examined the non-motorized application categories. Uh, just a couple of a couple of notes here: a total of 74.4 miles of RBTN bikeway um, bikeway miles have been built or programmed using regional solicitation funds. Um, Overall, the most significant takeaway was that the region could consider changing the bicycle and pedestrian measures by incorporating sort of a scoring criterion that considers the project's design and its ability ability to improve one's comfort level and safety. Um, the focus group overall considered this a stronger measure in evaluating a project's potential for generating bike ped usage and it's used by MPOs such as Dallas and St. Louis among others. Uh, next slide please. We also examine whether the risk assessment measures were beneficial. Uh, since 2014, 25 projects have been delayed or not built. 
Again, that's out of uh, 280 something, which I can't remember off the top of my head, I apologize. Um, 14 uh, were program year extensions, 11 were withdrawals. Uh, please do note this includes HSIP funded projects. So that constituted a high percent of those 25 projects. Um, program year extensions are requested. Uh, our findings suggest that the program year extensions are requested to better align awarded projects with other projects that are being built um, near the uh, project area. Uh, so 50% of the program year extensions were requested to help align a project's delivery um, or the construction schedule with other program projects in the area. So kind of the conclusion is that there's no evidence suggesting a common theme to the type of projects that request withdrawals. Uh, the only commonality of note is the HSIP withdrawals, which are uh, all tied to design and uh, scope changes. So no need to eliminate the risk assessment criteria or measures um, they have um, shown to be beneficial. All right, next slide, please. Getting into the key takeaways, overall, the project team felt that we could do a little bit better job on providing greater clarity on the goals of the regional sol solicitation program. What are we trying to fund? What are we trying to do? What are our priorities? Um, there's some concern, some uh, acknowledgement perhaps by our, our stakeholders that funding is being spread across too many funding categories which may make it a little bit unclear as to what we're trying to accomplish again. Um, it's also a little unclear um, based on our feedback, how some of these measures directly relate to the funding application categories. So many felt that there is a need for, on the council's behalf, to provide greater transparency on how projects are scored and selected and how the criteria is chosen as well. Um, and ta taking all that feedback, uh, which is very valuable feedback, um, we're gonna continue to reevaluate this process to ensure funds are going towards projects uh, with the greatest regional benefit and the, the going towards uh, projects that meet our goals um, and desires as a region. So um, that is it for me. The next is just a thank you slide and um, happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions or comments from council members? All right, they're quiet at the end of the meeting. So, uh, um, but no, thank you for doing this. And I'm glad that we continually go and look back. And I think that's really important because we wanna make sure that, yeah, the investments are getting directed in the right places and and really sort of reflect the values of, of TAB and the council. So thank you for, for the update, I appreciate it. Um, so with that, I'm gonna take, Yep, thanks, Dave. Have a good night. Um, one thing, um, just for the committee, um, you'll notice that um, uh, Jenna Ernst is not on the call tonight. So um, at, just as a reminder, um, MTS um, hosts the first six months of the year, and um, and and so the, our recording secretary comes from MTS. Uh, for the second half of the year, it comes through Metro Transit. So uh, first, a thank you to Jenna for supporting the committee for the first half of the year, and a welcome back to Becky Gorell. And I also want to just mention that uh, yesterday was Becky's five-year anniversary at Metro Transit. So congratulations and uh, keep up the good work. We're certainly happy to have you on board with us. So thanks, Becky. Um, all right. Anything from council members before we go? All right. Seeing and hearing nothing else, uh, we can be adjourned for the evening. Thank you all.